Good evening, Upper Six. So here we are. Um, paper two, um, theme 3.3.2, investment appraisal, and we're going to look at MPV and we're looking at payback. So before we move on, it's worth noting that this topic has been explored in total, however, mostly focused on paper three. So when we look at the past paper questions for this unit, which are from the document which you've downloaded before, uh, we will notice that paper three has where we've got the more complicated 12 and 20s. And so far, so far, paper two um, has only had some cheeky four markers. So make sure you can calculate. Yes, you need to practice the essays, but you need to be able to calculate to do those properly anyway. Now, if I was a sus suspicious sort of chap, I would be uh, thinking that uh, an examiner might put a 12 or a 20 mark financial appraisal question into next week's paper. So um, let's prepare for that, shall we, which will be quite important. You can go away and memorize the formulas. The technique for this for Calculate is easy. You write the formula in words, you write a blank formula, formula you go and find the numbers from the case study, um, you stick that in the blank form, you, you calculate the gaps, and then you answer the question. A bit like the PED question you did today in paper one, um, which, thank goodness, we've practiced that to death and some. Um, and let's face it, we've practiced nearly every single question in the paper. Uh, no surprises there, which was wonderful. If paper two is as generous as paper one, we should all be doing cartwheels in August, which should be quite funny. Anyway, so looking through these papers, um, we're going to look at this Cadbury's question. It is a 2018. If you go and have a look at the examiner report, which you can download, there's a terrible answer in there that the examiner's given 10 out of 12. The formulas are okay. It then, it then answers a very, very basic answer. You should read it, by the way. I don't think it would get 10 out of 12 nowadays because actually the examiners have asked us to be a little bit, as Dalmatians, of course, to be a little bit uh, more strict, but is still interpreting the standards. So we need to understand where those marks came from. If I was to mark that this afternoon, I would probably give that one about eight or nine. Okay, you go and have a look at it. Uh, not far off, it's within the range that uh, examiners are allowed, that two point range within 12 markers. But it is generally a terrible answer. Go and have a look at it, and then, if you're running out of time, when you write something like that, you're gonna get top level three, probably. Um, and we would call that in our lesson survival techniques, which we've talked about just in case we mess our timing up. So using the data in extract A, well, using means you better do a bloody calculation or you're gonna get marked down to level two. Um, we know that we need to demonstrate an understanding of net present value. Well, calculate, you'll demonstrate that. And payback, assess Mondelez International's investment. Um, we're gonna to have to demonstrate an understanding of that as well, hey? Um, in Cadbury's modernization. This is actually quite a complicated question. This is the second 12th marker in paper three for 2018. Uh, they are notoriously a little bit tricky and I'm thinking there's a lot of stuff I in here I need to know. However, this question is easy because all financial essay questions are really, really easy peasy. As long as you know your formulas. You do the maths at the top of the page, you write a basic answer Obviously, the normal chains of argument, balance, answer the question and justify. Um, and then you should get level four. Um, you don't need to write a lot because you've already done quite a lot of the work with the application and analysis through the, through the calculations. If you only write the calculations on the page, it, you're going to get about four marks, um, depending um, on what the uh, chief examiner tells the examiners. Um, so writing a little bit more on top of that but then again, it's such a beautiful use of the theory. And lots of students do the hard work, they do a calculation, and then they waffle. And they don't write anything that demonstrates a further understanding of it. I'm going to go through a bit of a technique where you're using the case study a bit better than just using the answers. Okay, so a couple of questions in there. So if we think about the spec up here, we've got net present value and we've got payback. So we've got payback and we've got net present value. When we go into here, we've got ARR um, and 
then we're talking about calculations of those and clearly its data is based on forecasts um, just because historic data is present does not mean that it is going to predict the future and let's face it half the time you haven't even got historic data so you've got to question the reliability and validity of the data um, which makes this easy just look for the examples in the case study you will be fine okay both of these 20 markers are looking at payback in MPV um, it doesn't mean that the next one you come across uh, sorry the 12 and the 20 marker um, is going to be exactly the same but you never know they've asked leadership questions and motivation theory questions in every paper one since 2016 so why not repeat the pattern we shall see so let's go through the theories with a bit of pros and cons so you've got a definition there calculates the difference between the present value of cash inflows and outflows over a period of time we've got our pros we can understand sort of the value of money over a period of time. Um, yes, it's sort of comprehensive because it analyzes our cash flows, but these are forecasts. So clearly we're going to question that quite a lot. Um, and what a, you know, providing holistic view of, a, we should have written potential financial impact there because we love to question the reliability. Um, it does assess risk to a point, but like any forecasting tool, it's only as good as the data and also the presumptions that you've got there as well. So we're going to question that discount factor and not just the numbers. You are given a discount factor of, say, 10%, and next to none of no students will actually question the reliability of the discount factor. Okay, so let's make sure that we do in some ways to demonstrate an understanding of it and not just obviously the profits and the revenues and all those sorts of things. The cons, well, it depends how accurate it is. Forecasting, it depends on the assumptions, the discount factor. And here is the case study from 2018. What a beautiful case study. Okay, so what we've got here is we've got a 10% discount factor. Um, and if you would have read the case study, you will see that all you have to do, we know that there's an initial investment of 75 million. So we've looked at the labels here. We know we've got five years worth of data here and it says 10% up there, but I'm not going to calculate it because it's there. I times that by that and I put it there. 75 in a column, yep, easy, nice and neat. Then calculate it. I'm not gonna put millions on the end of it at the moment. I'll probably do it at the end. And I've calculated it. And I've calculated it. And I've calculated it. And I've calculated it. And then I'm gonna add all those together. And then I'm gonna take away the 75 mil. You'll notice I've not rounded in the middle of my calculations. There's a really good reason for that because you're not meant to. Do not round in the middle of your calculations. It will mess your numbers up. Um, and even though the examiners might allow for, for people rounding, and sometimes in the past papers, if you look at the mark schemes, it gives you two possible answers, depending on how frequently students mess up. Um, do not round in the middle of calculations. You should have learned that with basic GCSE. And we've then got, and I've, shoved, I've shoved the unit descriptor on the end because it's millions of pounds. If I was it's meant to be a pound sign, but I haven't got a pen today. I've got my mouse. So we've got a three. We've got three decimal places. I could round that to eight one if I wanted to. By now, it's there. Now I would show that and nothing else at the beginning of my answer on the answer sheet. There's a big reason you don't do calculations in the data extract. The examiners will not see them. So if, you're, if you calculated your PED, for example, in paper one today, but in the data extract, and you got the answer wrong, you will get zero marks on that four marker. If you've messed it up slightly, but you've shown your workings, you might get three out of four for a wrong answer, depending on what you've done. Show your workings, and you've got that. And remember, for your essay, discount factor. And there's other stuff in the case study, obviously, that you can have a look at. 
Now, when we're thinking about payback period, I've already put the pros and cons up there for you. Payback is obviously the amount of time it's going to take you to pay it back. There is the formula that you will write in words. We know what the initial investment is. We know what the annual cash flow is and we need to work it out. So it is very simple, very simple, blunt force trauma on financial forecasting. Um, yes, we can look at risks. We can think about flows. The great thing is we can sort of go, oh, we might get our money back in three years. Well, actually, if this is something that's going to give us profit for 20 years, we would also assess how good that might be. Now, the longer the investment, you need to understand the more risky it is. So if this was a 20 year payback period, a lot can happen in 20 years. Just cast your mind back three years and we've got wars in Ukraine now. We've got Houthi rebels trying to bomb our cargoes, cargo ships going through um, the, the Red Sea. Um, we've got warring factions in Sudan um, and you've got economic turmoil. Um, the Chinese might be invading maybe economically or politically Taiwan in the future. There's a lot going on. The longer the payback period, the more probably inaccurate the forecasts are going to be. OK, yes, it ignores the value of money. We compare it, compare and contrast our other um, investment appraisal tool. Um, and we're thinking about cash flow after. Well, this tool doesn't, does it? Because all you're doing is calculating the payback time. Um, and it's not really a profitability measure, is it? It's just paying back on, on that factor. And also, we don't know what happens to the investment after the period. How long is, are we going to have this? Is it going to be outdated? You know, the, the Cadbury case study is talking about innovation through investment, new machineries, probably making chocolate bars or something exciting. Um, is a new one coming out next week? I don't know. Why don't we write about it? So here is an example, because the example in the case study is too easy to actually teach this properly. Um, so we've got our initial £100,000 um, and we've got four years worth of cash flows. OK, so we'll calculate year one and we, we've got that much left because we know it's there. OK, 100 minus that equals that. Pretty easy maths. Year two. Take the 30 away from that and we get 50. Easy so far. Even easier, we're going to take 40 away from 50 and we're left with 10. And this is where it doesn't get tricky, to be honest with you, but it's a bit different. First three years are always easy. Show your workings. And then what we're looking for is we're going to take that 50. We're going to find out what the monthly is. We're then going to take how much money we need, which is the 10 grand that's left over. We're going to divide it by the monthly so we can work out how many months it is. 2.4 months, uh, 1, 2, 3, plus 2.4 is 3 years and 2.4 um, 2 months. If the question says rounded to the nearest month, you could put 3... Uh, you could put 3.3. You can't put 3.2 because you'll miss your payback target, remember. Um, so it, it's a bit like when you do break-even analysis of units, for example. You can't round it down, you round it up. If in doubt, why don't you write both of them? And then the examiner will come along and they'll go, that's the right answer. And even if that's not, they'll mark the correct one, won't they? It's called positive marking. I'm sure all your teachers have told you about it. OK, there you go. That's how you do it. Now let's have a look at the case study. So I'm going to start off by writing my formula because we're good students. We know A, that's worth a mark and B, it helps me to go to the case study and find out what I'm looking for. Now, we want to know how many years it's going to take to pay back 75 million pounds. Now, I'm not even sure if we need to do this calculation um, because 20, 45, 45 plus 30 is, not exactly hard maths, is it? Let's face it. Um, which is why lots of people in this paper simply wrote down the answer. My advice is 20, plus 25 plus 30 equals 75 minus 75 equals there you go 
So this is an extract from the past paper, um, from the examiner report, sorry. And we can see that actually this student's done a really good job, I think. Um, they've worked out, obviously still in minuses, and, and then they've worked out that it's three years. They've also put this in there, which is quite useful. Shame they didn't use it in their essay, by the way, because they could have talked about um, future um, revenue after the, after the payback period. Um, so I think they missed a trick there, to be honest with you. But if you're watching this video before paper two, something similar comes up. I can imagine what your mops would be after the payback period. Anyway, let's have a look at this question. So we know that we are using the data. Whenever we see that, we are doing a calculation if there are numbers in there. It tells us what calculations we are going to do. It's about a chocolate company, Mondelez International, Cadbury's. And we know we need to be talking about this investment. Investment in what? Um, I would like to know. This is about chocolate. I don't really want to be seeing too many products. I want to see chocolate bars. I want to see chocolate. I want to see brands of chocolate. Um, popping candy Cadbury bars or something like that, which are quite nice for the big kids of us. This is a 12 marker. So I need, for this one, we've got two calculations. I need a P paragraph with a however, including my calculation in there somewhere and questioning the reliability of the data. I need option two. It's like a 20 marker, but not quite as much. Um, I'm going to talk about payback and I'm going to do a P paragraph. However, I'm then going to answer the question, assess the investment in modernization. Is it good or is it bad? Using the language of finance, I'm then going to justify. And I think with this one, I could get away with without the modernization, without the investment. They may not be able to. They might have benefited from that creates something. And if that is a forward focused statement, yeah, then you've got your mops and your justification. And that's really what I think the examiners are looking for. They're not looking for a separate mops statement. They're looking for your justification, your recommendations in 20 markers to be focused on a bit on the future, long term, short term, those sorts of things. So we are going to start off at the top of our page with our calculations. So payback is there, even though I didn't calculate that, I stole it, but never mind. And there are my other workings. Now they're at the top of the paper. I can see them. I can, I've can. i also remembered that this 10% discount factor was something that I will probably question the reliability of that discount factor, because that's an estimate, let's face it. I'm then going to show off, not repeating, I'm going to show off um, my calculation because I'm so proud of it and I'm going to use the right unit descriptors with a pound and a millions next to it. The calculated MPV of that suggests a positive return on Mondelez International's 75 million investment in Cadbury's modernization. I've abbreviated it to MI. It doesn't do it up here. I haven't got time in the real exam to write Mondelez International 10 times. If I, just in case I was going to repeat that, I think I've repeated it once, um, I'm going to put MI. It saves me a millisecond um, and it makes me feel nice. Then I'm going to go on to my main argument. Now, actually, there's a chain of argument in here as well. Suggests a positive return. Yes, it's my point, but mm, might get away with that as a chain of argument. Um, assesses the value added by an investment. That's application, by the way. It's a bit of use of theory there. Taking into account the time value of money. More demonstration of knowledge of what NPV is. The positive NPV indicates that the project cash flows from the modernization will exceed the initial investment costs. Adjusted for 10% discount. That's not in the question. That's more application. All I'm doing here is describing the theory and the process of calculating in context. And then I'm going to come back to the hook in the question, which is clearly assess this. I should have put a H next to that. That is definitely sort of assess the value type thing is what we'd see in the more modern questions or something like that. Assess is what we have from 2018 paper. This shows a very a viable sorry, project that should increase the company's net worth proving the investment's potential to generate 
possible returns. If only I would have dropped that on the end of that sentence, I would have been fine. It's 12 marker. We've got five chains of argument in there before we've even got to the however point. But more importantly, context, 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 and also loads of context, a judgment. You know, it's going to generate a positive uh, return. Fantastic, hopefully. However, here's my counter argument. Despite the promising MPV, let's question the reliability of the data. The initial outlay of 75 million is substantial. Well, it would be for me. Yeah? And might be a financial risk if the expected cash flows do not materialize as projected, as in your, proje your projections might be wrong. The payback period of three years, yeah, suddenly bringing in another calculation with a positive MPV also supports the investment's attractiveness. Okay, so actually, I've just merged my however into the first sentence of the next paragraph. I got too excited. So we're there. Um, and here we are talking, obviously, about questioning the reliability of data. And we've dropped in a bit of context with a reference back to the £75 million investment and it's big. OK, then we go on to the next, the next point. And the payback period is a straightforward method used to evaluate the time it takes for the investment to repay its initial cost and the net cash flow it generates. Loads of knowledge there. The three-year payback period and the substantial 75 million investment seems relatively quick. That's actually me interpreting the data. Suggesting efficient capital recovery and reduced risk of it's not very long. This is particularly important in the dynamic food industry. Nice context where quick returns can provide flexibility for further investments, especially if there's a new machine that comes along, or operational enhancements. Now, a lot of that is very knowledge-based, straight out of the textbook. All we're doing is we're describing payback. We're dropping in a bit of context, which is the numbers, the three years, 75 million. Yes, we've already said that in the previous point. And we've dropped a, a dynamic food industry quote in there, okay? lovely context however let's question the reliability of the data the reliance on achieving these forecasted returns within the three within three years does not account for unforeseen delays for instance if the machinery breaks i just made that up or market changes because it's chocolate i thought increased costs of chocolate yeah, I think any of us can work that out, that might adversely affect Cadbury's operations. All we're doing in these counter arguments is questioning the reliability of the data. Easy peasy. Overall, let's quickly read the question again. Assess the investment with these tools. MIs, told you I'd use it again, investment in modernizing Cadbury's production facilities appears to be a good financial decision. I've assessed it. If we were marking this in class, I'd put an A for answer. Although, we've got without in there, don't panic, I've not gone mad. Although returns are based on predictions, including the estimated discount factor, I had to get it in there somewhere. I had to question the reliability of even the discount factor, let alone all the other stuff that's in there. Yeah, it just shows that we sort of understand um, when, when we're calculating these things. Without this investment, it might not be able to increase, as in Cadbury's, by the way, might not be able to increase production efficiency. Very abstract. And I just thought, what can we do? And then I thought, chocolate. Or meeting growing consumer demands, this is in the case study, like dairy milk, marvellous creations, or Oreo bars. Okay, context is king. That includes in your conclusion. Now you need to understand there's a lot of marks here for evaluation. And when we look at our favourite document, we are looking for, not perfection, we're looking for level four. Now, when we look through this, is it accurate? Well, it is for the finances and the interpretation. We have contextualised to death because we've done calculations 
um, and we've drawn conclusions from those calculations. We've talked about the behavior um, just in case a machine breaks, for example, or you know, a forecasting. Are there good chains of argument? You can go in and count them if you want to. I can't be bothered. There's at least five. Is it balanced? Well, that's why we put however's on a separate line. And that's why I've written the justification on a separate line. And this lovely word here signposts whoever's reading it to, here's a slightly, slight addition to my argument. That's something more, something more that the examiners are looking for in your conclusion. Just repeating something you've already written. You're not getting marks for it because you've already got the marks. You're not having them twice. Is it wide ranging? Well, is it more than two arguments? Well, I can see five on that page. I think that's more than two. Is it contextualized? Silly question. Um, quantitative, qualitative, awareness of competing arguments. Well, that cheeky little sentence there is um, actually a bit of a comparison. Three years, NPV, yeah bringing both of those arguments together, quite nice. And we've got leading to a supported judgment. And this supported is a bit of that. This is my overall answer, remember, a one-liner with a full stop, directly answer the question. Make sure you reread the question first to make sure you're answering the exact question. Some students get excited and answer a totally different question, unfortunately. Um, and this little bit is the little bit extra that some of the examiners are looking for okay what we've got is a level four answer um you decide what mark it is i don't care it's level four maybe it may not be perfect but it's definitely level four enjoy the afternoon and uh do the other past paper questions um that you've got in that document enjoy <laughs>